Um, so uh, my name is Joe Fennell. I'm a researcher on the Branching Out Project. Um, so today here, we also have uh, Joanne Morris. We've got Hannah Walker, Toby Pilat, and Debbie Maxwell, all from the Branching Out team, all across different disciplines. And I think uh, the easiest way for them to introduce themselves is probably when you see the presentation, you'll see uh, the different work that they've been doing on this project. Um, but yes, I think without further ado, we're going to get started with the presentations. Um, we've got five different sections to this presentation, each of us running our own little bit. And then at the end, we've got time for some discussion and some summary. So, uh, Debbie, would you mind please sharing the presentation for us? Okay, I'm going to hand over to Joanne now to introduce the project. Lovely, thanks, Joe. And so, yeah, welcome everyone and thanks for coming and joining us today. And um, we'll be telling you a little bit about the ways that our branching out project has achieved its objective of combining biophysical data and storytelling to capture the social and cultural values of trees. And in particular, as uh, Julie said, uh, using spatial data for valuing trees, mapping that value, and finally communicating value in ways that are more inclusive of social and cultural value than previously. So I'll just say a brief word about the project's objectives and the data that we collected to set the scene for Joe, Hannah, Toby and Debbie. So we've brought together the um, disciplines of forestry, remote sensing, archaeology, storytelling and deliberative participatory science. And so our first aim was to establish an effective culture for interdisciplinary working and dialogue. And that included uh, developing a common treescape values framework that bridges epistemologies and synergizes perspectives from across the natural and social sciences, arts and humanities. Then we aim to use data from each discipline in a deliberative process between researchers, policymakers, other end users and citizens. And that was to develop and express past, present and future treescape narrative co-develop indicators that link narrative values to characteristics of treescapes, and test out new innovative policy approaches for integrating social and cultural values into treescape decisions. To achieve that, we have developed detailed maps of urban treescapes of the past and present with a new comprehensive database of tree characteristics across our focal cities, which are York, Cardiff and Milton Keynes. Finally, we're establishing processes for communicating social and cultural values of the present and future treescapes to publics and decision-making audiences alongside ecosystem services and economic value. Now, our data, we've collected uh, stories in various ways. We've collected uh, 70 folk tales, legends and myths from the UK and around the globe. And then in each city, we held storytelling workshops with altogether 255 members of the general public and community groups across all three cities. We also established two panels in each city, a panel of end users who are made up of about 15 people in each city who have some sort of decision-making stake. And the second panel is made up of 30 local people recruited for us to be representative as, as representative as possible of the local population in each city. And from all of those interactions, those storytelling interactions, we collected 514 stories of what trees mean to those people in the present and future. And the stories that we collected were analyzed according to our branching out values framework, as well as coded according to the themes emerging from the data. And Hannah is going to tell us a bit more about we asked our participants about the characteristics of the trees that are meaningful to them. So about 40% of the stories are geolocated. Some feature a specific tree, whereas others are more general. Sometimes participants talked about the characteristics of the trees in their stories, other times not. Then we've got the spatial data, and Joe and Toby will tell you more about that. For past trees, we've got hand-drawn representation of individual trees, on the first Ordnance Survey County series map, digitized using com computer vision techniques. And for present day trees, we've got hyperspectral remote sensing flyovers of the core of each city, which Joe has processed to demarcate individual tree canopies. And then Hannah and Debbie will tell um, about how we've brought the spatial data and storytelling all together. 
in their sections. And I'll hand over now to Joe to talk about remote sensing. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm going to talk about the using the geospatial data to estimate the replacement asset value of trees in the UK. So you may be wondering why we were interested in developing financial methods when the scope of the branching out project is clear to, to extend beyond these monetary valuations. The main reason is that it is a useful tool for engaging with organisations that manage risk and assets, so for example, local authorities. Um, but it should be remembered that this is just one of the many tools that can be used for producing valuations of trees. And indeed, we're going to have more, um, we're going to hear more about these other values from other parts of the project as we go through this presentation. The method we have um, based our work on is CAVA. So this is the capital asset value for amenity trees. It's a method that was designed explicitly to encourage the value of trees as assets and not as liabilities. The existing methods of cover assessment are the full method and the quick method. So the full method requires an expert to visit the site and assess many different factors, including the tree condition, the size, and the suitability of the tree within the location. It's a time-consuming process and it's suited to situations where detailed assessment is needed of only a few trees. The second existing method is the quick method, which requires a few measurements um, and is more suited to inventory estimation, but it still does require people to manually go out and collect data about those trees, albeit not necessarily the experts. Okay. Um, so this is where our approach comes in. CAVAT baseline is a remote sensed estimate of the maximum replacement asset value of a tree. It's suited to many thousands of trees and can be applied at very large scale. So what is isn't it? It's not a CABAT full valuation. This requires an on-the-ground expert assessment. It's also not a CABAT quick because this needs a condition assessment and also a life expectancy estimate. Again, this is made by an assessor during a field survey. Um, okay, how does the method work? So first of all, we generated a large data set of all trees in the survey area using specialist aerial imagery um, and also ordnance survey mapping data. So this provided the underlying data set that we called the individual tree data set. This is a data set of individual tree crowns with their sizes and contextual data attached. This was also used for other parts of the project. Every tree in the individual tree data set is then taken and run through a statistical model to predict the most likely CABAT baseline asset value. Okay, so first of all, here's the individual tree data set for Milton Keynes. It covers the majority of the city area. The pink areas are areas of tree canopy and the inset image shows a zoomed in area with the individual polygons showing the tree crowns um, in green. So this bit here in the right hand side of the slide. The advantage of this data set is that it allows us to look at the distribution of tree characteristics at the landscape level. So this is an animated fly through showing the tree data set over Milton Keynes. We'll just let that run a couple of times so you can take it in. But effectively, you can see here that it's allowing us to look at the individual tree crowns across the city. OK, uh, next slide, please. So um, some headline figures from our assessment. So in the survey area we saw for Milton Keynes, we detected 260,000 tree crowns. And we estimated that the combined CABAT baseline replacement asset value for these crowns was around £6.9 billion, just for that area that you could see in the previous image. The median value for the tree crowns in this area was £17,266. That's the price for each tree crown. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we validate these numbers? So we carried out field surveys in six one hectare sites across Milton Keynes, covering different land use types. We surveyed the tree diameter at breast height, which is a standard um, arboricultural measure for each tree in the site, and manually delineate, delineated these crowns uh, in a GIS package. The top row of images on the right hand side shows the hand delineations for two of the sites, and the bottom row shows the outputs from the branching out canopy model. So 
we compared the CAVAT baseline for each one hectare plot to the ground assessment value that we made when we did the field work. We did this for our model, the BOCM, and also for another data set, the National Tree Map. And this is a less expensive, commercially available tree map than you can buy. So our model performed best for predicting CAVAT baseline, that's the top plot, and canopy cover, bottom left plot. However, neither model performed particularly well for estimating the number of canopies, the canopy count. That's the bottom right plot. Okay, application and conclusion. So in the paper, we present a possible application for a data set such as this. Um, the figure shows a city level analysis where the CAVAT baseline was calculated for a four hectare box around the center of each postcode. Each postcode polygon is then colored with this value in this plot. The purple indicates less than average, and the green indicates a higher than average uh, value per hectare. This shows huge variation across the city. The average value was approximately £600,000 per hectare. Um, however, some postcodes had over £1.5 million per hectare in tree assets, compared to others with less than £100,000 per hectare. So this is all I have time to present, but please do get in touch and read the preprint, which I'll paste the link to in the chat. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah now. Thank you, Joe. Uh, my name is Hannah Walker. I work at Forest Research, and I will talk about how we have used the individual tree data that Joe just described in combination with the stories um, to look at the potential provision of social and cultural values. Here are some uh, examples of stories that we've collected in the project. Um, so at the top left, we have a story of the present, which is um, a quote or an anecdote from one of the citizen panels, which says, three days in the week when I work, I follow a path of trees because I can have an hour with no kids, no husband before work. And I like to get in as many steps as I can. So I follow a path of trees. On the right hand side, uh, we have one of the visual stories, which is some artwork by a young person who attended one of the storytelling workshops um, showing different aspects of their love of trees. And on the left, we have an example of a story of the past, which goes, no sooner spoken than suddenly there was a tall shapely tree before him, its branches stretching out over the desert, the canopy of leaves laying out an enticing circle of cool shade. So within all of the different stories that we've collected, as Joanne mentioned, um, people have mentioned different social and cultural values, which we have collected together in what we're calling themes or value themes. And they also mentioned um, tree characteristics. So all of the stories have been read and have been tagged um, according to the values and all the tree characteristics they contain. So examples of value themes are history, connection to people, or connection to trees. And more of those are shown on the left-hand side there. And examples of tree characteristics are trees in gardens, uh, woodland trees, which was a very um, frequent mention, or just the presence of trees in general. So by reading each of the stories, we can look for meaningful and robust associations between um, the value themes, which are shown along the top of this matrix, the top row, and the tree characteristics, um, which are down the left-hand side. So for example, several stories refer to both history and large trees, and that association is usually a meaningful one within an individual story because it's the size of the tree that makes the storyteller think of age and the passage of time. So we've done this for all stories, uh, or rather we are doing this for all stories, it's ongoing work. And we can build a matrix like this, which shows the contribution of each tree characteristic down the left-hand side to each value theme across the top. So you can see um, colored in darker green here where there is particularly strong associations between, for example, woodland uh, and sense of place. And another example that's very strong is between trees in parks and health and well-being. Um, and the work that I'll present here is a partial analysis and includes 101 stories from 
citizen panels, stories of the past and storytelling workshops. And then we can use the individual tree data set that uh, Joe talked about to map some of those tree characteristics. So this is um, a map of large trees across Milton Keynes. Um, and we can then use the matrix that I showed earlier to estimate potential provision of different value themes um, across the city. And this map here shows the potential provision of history across Milton Keynes, which is driven largely by where there are large trees. And it also coincides with where we have um, higher than average caveat value as well. Um, the darker purple colors here indicate that there is more likely to be potential provision of that particular social and cultural value. And finally, we can sum the value themes together to indicate potential provision of all of the values across the city. And this is Milton Keynes again, showing likely potential provision of value in some places such uh, as the woodlands, those are the dark patches and some of the major roads. But interestingly, relatively low potential provision of value in the city centre, which is at the top left where that grid pattern is, um, despite the presence of trees in that area. The work is ongoing, um, but we can say so far that citizen panels and storytelling are really effective ways to learn about social and cultural values that people hold for trees. There are strong associations between some tree characteristics and some social and cultural values, but not all of them. So not all values can be generalized and mapped. This work simplifies what people told us. And so we lose um, the nuance and the context. So while it's useful for broad representation of potential value, people still need to be present and to be able to give their views when decisions are being made. And finally, um, mapping potential provision of these values demonstrates that some areas in cities have poor provision and this can help inform urban forest management. And now I will hand over to Toby. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the past. Um, and you might be wondering in this project that's looking at how we value trees in contemporary urban environments and more broadly, how to encourage tree planting into the future, why we're interested in the past. Why does the past matter? Well, I've outlined three, three reasons here and there are, I'm sure, many more. Um, firstly, we know that people value old trees, and this is reflected in our legal protections for special trees um, and who are, that are often old themselves um, in the form of tree preservation orders. And now there is a national debate going on about how we reform and strengthen these protections. Secondly, um, historic character has formed an important part of planning processes um, for over 30 years now. And as part of that, it's recognised that trees um, are living artefacts that contribute to a character um, of a place and, and then for places in high character areas have, have tree preservation orders. Finally, we know that ancient woodland is highly valued um, by people um, aesthetically, culturally and ecologically. Um, but what about smaller places, the relic field boundaries, unloved land on the margins, um, woody clumps, places that may not contain very old trees, um, but have hosted trees for 100 years or more? Could these historic tree sites be as important as well? Um, so the past is important from a values perspective, but in order to examine um, any of these issues, we need to understand how the contemporary treescape was formed. And in part, that means understanding um, where trees were in the past. Fortunately, we have an excellent source um, for looking at where trees were in the past. Um, this is the Ordnance Surveys County series, um, the first edition of which was mapped um, uh, in Britain, across Britain in the 18, between the 1850s and the 1890s um, at a scale of 1 to 2500. And amazingly, on these maps, the Ordnance Survey marked freestanding trees, um, as well as the woodlands and orchards that we're used to seeing on later maps. And my archival research has shown that um, the OS aimed to plot um, every large or conspicuous tr uh, uh, tree, except for where the symbols for those trees would confuse or obscure other map detail. Um, and then unfortunately, they stopped mapping these freestanding trees 
um, from the 1890s onwards. But these maps are great. Uh, they can enable us, enable us to get a really good picture of where trees were in the past. Um, but even though these, these maps are now available digitally, they are just pictures. If we want to count trees to find out where they are, you have to do it manually. Um, so the work that I've shown here um, is a 1% sample, is drawn from a 1% sample across the east of England, um, which involved me, uh, well, mainly me and some colleagues, clicking on over 138,000 individual tree symbols. Um, so what we need is a way of moving from the scanned images, known as rasters, basically massive tables um, of pixel values, um, to vector files, with each tree recorded as a point coordinate that can be located in geographic space, i.e. using the Ordnance Survey National Grid. And this would then enable very easy spatial statistics um, in GIS software and comparison um, with other tree, tree, tree data or spatial data. Um, so what we need then is a computer vision approach. Computer vision um, is simply the computer recognition of objects or people in digital images. And the most basic form of this is, is called template matching. Uh, a template image, in this case, um, the club symbol, is run over a, a larger image, pixel by pixel, and the instances of that symbol um, or, or that template image are recorded. And you might think that an OS tree symbol would be easy to find in this way, um, but it's not. Uh, for a start, different divisions of the OS use different symbols um, on different parts of the survey. Uh, and then even if we had a template for e each of the different types of symbols used, template, template matching would still be very, very difficult. Um, and that's because symbols vary for all sorts of different reasons. Um, they can be clustered. Uh, close together or truncated, they can be obscured or modified by other map detail, for example, field boundaries, and it can be very hard to differentiate freestanding tree symbols um, from those that denote areas of woodland, and you can see that in the image on the bottom right. In order to tackle this variation, uh, we need a deep learning approach. Our deep learning approach that we've developed is called um, You Only Look for a Symbol Once, um, aka Yolzo, um, and it's based on the you only look once method. Um, Yolzo is a single shot detector, meaning you only have to put an image through the network once, no matter how many different classes of symbol you're trying to detect. Uh, and it's very finely tuned to detect both freestanding trees and areas of woodland. So um, generally speaking, other methods only detect one or the other, but we're trying to do both freestanding trees and areas of woodland. So to explain very simply how it works, um, we first quasi-manually labelled up 165 one, kilometer, uh, one square kilometre map tiles um, from which we produced uh, crops that we used to train the network. Um, and then when we're detecting, we feed one, uh, again, one kilometre square map tiles into the, into the network. Um, it divides that tile into a grid and each, for each of the cells in that grid, it calculates whether the center of a symbol, of a tree symbol, falls within that cell. And if it does, um, it, it, it calculates where in the cell. Uh, does it work? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, it's much more accurate than non-bespoke uh, computer vision methods. Um, it, as I said, it combines regions, woodland, and points freestanding trees, which other methods can't do. And it can scan a one, uh, a one square kilometre map tile in as little as 40 milliseconds, uh, which is great when you're trying to do um, uh, scan vast numbers uh, of map tiles. Um, it's not without some issues, though. It does sometimes get classification of symbols wrong. Um, for example, it struggles um, with orchards because um, the OS used the same symbol for orchards as it does for um, freestanding uh, um, fruit trees. Um, and it's sometimes difficult for, for, for when it's sometimes difficult for me to tell the difference. Um, and it can also have trouble differentiating between different types of woodland. But all these issues can be addressed somewhat um, with more training data. What can we do with this new data set generated by Yolzo? Um, well, we can estimate how many trees were in the landscape. Uh, using a combination of OAS archive sources um, and historic photographs, we can start to work out how the distribution of tree symbols relates to actual canopy cover in the past. 
Um, then, of course, we can start to compare past tree cover um, with that of today, and we can statistically examine patterns of tree cover in the past. Um, for example, did freestanding trees um, cluster around settlements? In urban areas, is there a link between building and development and the number of trees? Uh, and of course, we can begin to answer those questions around value that hinge on us knowing where those trees were in the past. Which are the old trees that should have protection orders? To what extent can modern assessments of character um, be related to the distribution of trees now and in the past? And where are those historic tree sites that, that, that have harboured trees for over 100, 150 years? Um, and this really is just scratching the surface of potentially what we can do. So thank you very much. That's me. And now it's over to Debbie. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Toby. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Maxwell. I'm from the University of York. And um, I'm going to give a quick overview of the design aspect of, of branching out and in particular how it relates to, um, to spatial work. So, um, so we've been using design approaches in the branching out project as a way to try and bring together lots of different areas and outputs of the project. We've run workshops with stakeholders and general public and uh, conducted a series of interviews. And we've run various design jams and sprints to generate different ideas and prototypes. Our workshops are generally um, lo-fi um, using pen and paper and physical materials so that there's no barrier to entry and so that it provides a way to make abstract ideas concrete very quickly, as these images um, illustrate. We've got two key outputs at the moment from this um, part of the project. Um, and again, very briefly as an explanation, we consider these outputs to be design probes. So that is um, very uh, early stage in progress tools or interventions that allow us to more deeply explore a problem and raise questions rather than necessarily solving problems. And ChatGP3 is, is our first probe. It's a mobile website that's triggered by um, a person using their phone to scan a QR code that's attached to a tree, as you can see in the right hand image. And um, the user can then have a conversation with that tree. And um, the tree knows where it is. Um, it knows what other trees are nearby and, and asks the user questions during their conversation. As our name suggests, it uses ChatGPT as well as other data that we've provided it with from the project. And so we're exploring potential uses of this intervention and we'd be happy to discuss these afterwards. Um, but for now, we've observed people interacting with ChatGPT in different ways. Um, individually and uh, looking at and even physically embracing um, the trees um, themselves at times. Um, others learning together in small groups. And even those people who perhaps don't scan the codes are taking the time to look at individual trees in more detail and start to think about them. Um, but let's move on to the second design probe. So our second design probe is, is a mobile game. And this came out of a design sprint. It's limited in scope right now. It's, uh, it's a vertical slice of a game, um, but it does have sufficient functionality that allows us to imagine how people might create an urban treescape, such as a park, and provides us with some sense of time passing and to start to imagine the impact of trees on an environment, um, changing the character of the place, providing canopy cover, etc. So let's um, have a quick look at the game. So this is the point where I see if it, if it works. <laughs> um, good, that seems to be playing. Um, so I've done this as a playthrough rather than live demo just to uh, reduce any technical uh, complexity. It's designed to be used on a mobile device and we start with a blank landscape as you can see now. For now it's generic, but you could imagine this being tailored to a specific site. Um, and you can add trees um, as you can see here on the screen. And so there's a variety of different species that can be added. Um, we selected the ones that were most commonly, uh, frequently named um, from our branching out data, particularly um, the stories. And you can see these sliders at the top left hand side, park charm, biodiversity canopy, and these adjust as more trees are added um, or removed. Um, you can also uh, manipulate the landscape. I'm just going to skip through a little bit here. Um, let's see. Uh, and so, um, just a little bit. OK, 
Okay, and uh, and you can also add in um, park infrastructure too. So you can see here, you can add in a cafe and street lights and um, benches, um, etc. Uh, and you'll see that time passes too. So we kind of move quite quickly from um, uh, day to night. Uh, and you can see at the moment we're in year one uh, spring. Um, and so we pass through the seasons and eventually the years, although I've not, I've not put the years on this in the interest of time. Um, we're working on showing tree growth, um, but that's not been implemented, implemented yet. Um, and then finally, you can also see that there's some information about what you've planted here. We've got some very basic kind of analytics, which maybe is some aesthetic work, but it indicates how many trees you've planted, gives you some information or some guidance as to what you could do, um, uh, and allows you to remind yourself of what trees it is that you actually have planted um, as well. So um, I'm going to skip through this. So um, as you can see, it's still in a very early stage, really, this game, um, but that's why it is really a design probe. It's designed to, um, to allow us to explore questions and allow people to see it in this um, early stage. And so we're using it really to investigate some, some use cases, which might be how, how might something like this start to educate people on the complexity and value of planting trees in an urban landscape? Um, how might it be used perhaps in consultation processes or um, management or even kind of future visioning? Um, it's a, again, it's a very low barrier of entry in order to, to play this game and to engage with it. Um, and we're also looking at possibilities of exploring the historic tree landscape, um, for instance, some of Toby's work that he's been explaining, um, as well as looking at the present and, and the future landscapes too. So if you do have any interest in experimenting with either ChatGP tree or, or the game, then please do let me know. These are in kind of early, um, quite malleable stages. But I will hand um, back over to Joe. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everybody, for presenting there. Um, so if we could just have the next slide, please, Debbie. Thank you. Um, OK, so just a quick recap. So, uh, so Joe introduced the project for us and explained the main objectives. Um, I talked about the Cavat baseline work. Uh, Hannah talked about mapping the social and cultural values and linking these with the value themes. Toby's talked about the historic trees and Debbie's finally uh, talked about the design work that's been going on in the project. So I think at this point, um, we'd just like to take any questions. Uh, yeah, and please do uh, tell us who you'd like the questions addressed to as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. You packed in a lot of your work from branching out in that, um, a lot to take in. So really, really interesting stuff. Um, so yes, so as Joe said, we would like to open up the floor for any questions. Um, so please do put your hand up. I can't see any in the chat at the moment, but please feel free to put questions in the chat if you have any. Um, I can kick it off. Um, I do have a question, um, particularly for, for Debbie on the design work that you've been doing um, in terms of the mobile game. I wondered if you've been co-designing that with any end users um, in mind. Um, and also does it um, does it take into account what is feasible or what might work in those locations? Um, how do you build that into the design of the game? Because obviously not, you know, not everything would work in different sites and locations. So just wondered if you could say a little bit about that, maybe. Um, sure, absolutely. Uh, so it was uh, the game idea was um, partly partly co-designed, but not necessarily with end end user stakeholders. It came out of of a design sprint that we ran over the summer. So we ran um, a week long design sprint with um, uh, with designers, with members in the project team, with um, GIS experts. And, uh, and a kind of mix of, of creatives where we gave people um, a kind of brief about the project and um, 
and uh, sort of data around the project and invited them to come up with ideas. Uh, and so this was one of the ideas that emerged from this and this um, was developed with people from, from the project team as well. So, um, so it draws on it draws on the data that we had gathered previously from across the project, which included data from, from end users as well as um, uh, interviews that we had done as part of the design design work. So in that sense, it fed on that data, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say that it was co-designed with, with mm. uh, end users and stakeholders in that way. Um, at the end of that design sprint, we had um, uh, some dragons who we pitched the ideas to, and one of whom is someone who's from our advisory board and is a um, arboreal um, consultant. And so we've been working with her as well after this. So she's been feeding into it from that perspective. Um, it's not necessarily a, a co-designed. Um, it's yeah, it's not it's not co-designed, but it is it is a an embryonic game that I think is quite malleable so that we can then go out and take it to people and say, how might you use this? What what would need to change? What would need to evolve in this in order for it to be something which would be useful for you? So it's about it's about taking it out as a provocation rather than a co-designed game. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of that complexity that you've you've mentioned, it's it's not included in at the moment. Um, every time we have we show the game or we have conversations about it, people are like, oh, it'd be great if you could have uh, this in it, we could have uh, time in it, we could see things growing, we could see what would happen in, in 20 years or something that looks good now and moves on. And, um, you know, how would it, yeah, how do we think about the under, underlying soil substrate and what, what could grow and what wouldn't grow there and what would be appropriate and what does that have for the social and cultural values? And it's just fantastic, I think, as a, as a tool that allows us to explore these things um, in terms of scope, it, it would be, I think, another another huge project to be able to implement all these things in it. So it's about being practical at the moment, what we can implement into it. But certainly we, we're trying to explore ways that we can expand this uh, and think carefully about what should be included. So it's not it's not um, a decision support tool, is it? It's it's kind of a, it's like you say, it's a design, a design tool, which is a yes. bit different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We could imagine it being used um, by sort of general public potentially because it can run on a mobile phone, it can run on an iPad, and you could imagine it being used potentially, you know, sort of in a, in a site, you know, in a park location and saying, okay, this is what we're with now, what would it look like in the future? Um, and even maybe aggregating lots of different insights from people to see what people might might imagine the future should look like for that space, rather than perhaps, yeah, um, I guess a decision support tool for... Um, a tree officer say or something yeah yeah great thank you any other questions i do have another question but i want to let other people come forward which i can't see any hands so i will ask joe another a question about um cavat and the valuation work that you've been doing you said a little bit about what that might be useful um so i wondered if you could just speak about maybe the i'm going back to end users again but maybe the types of end users who would use it would it be local authorities um who might use that information and how might they use it what sort of decisions would they might use that for uh, well, thanks for your, your question, Julie. Um, I think, actually, given that we've got an expert, sorry to put you on the spot, Anna, but an expert on CABAT here, um, more generally on CABAT, not necessarily just the CABAT um, RS, but obviously as a co-designer for this this tool as well. Um, Hannah, would you would you like to elaborate on that point? I will. Please, would you repeat the question, Julie? Yeah, it was just about um, who you see um, using the outcomes from that piece of work so the sort of economic valuation what what would it be local authorities that would be interested to know what the economic kind of asset value of the trees in their locations are and what is the value of that knowledge what might they use that knowledge for uh yes i think it would be local authorities primarily um some many local authorities already use a version of cap apps that either the quick version, which they calculate using their tree inventories or the full version if they're using it to, for example, request compensation if a valuable tree is going to be removed. Um, and that typically uh, happens where development is occurring and a tree 
is permitted to be felled for that development and those sorts of things, or if there's damage or um, perhaps in subsidence cases. So those are good use cases for normal cavat. Um, this wouldn't be used in those kind of really specific one tree situations, but it, it um, one use case that we've discussed is that gives an indication of a kind of spatial value that's present, for example, before you start even thinking about where a development might be. So where is there lots of value in trees that you may wish to avoid or maybe problematic for your development? So there's a role for people and uh, there's a use for uh, this for everybody involved in planning process. And I think it's also a nice communication tool um, from local authorities to various people um, to show the massive value of amenity that's provided by trees across an urban area. And that's not something that we've had before. So that's quite exciting. Thanks, Hannah. Put better than I could have put it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks. That's that's really helpful. Sorry, my connection's going a bit unstable. I've just turned my video off. Um, yeah, we've got um, a question in the chat from Melissa. Um, this one's for you, Toby. Uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. In terms of the historic trees, um, what kind of spatial scale did you map these? And is the methodology code to repeat this in other regions publicly available? Yeah, sure. So. Um... So we were primarily using the, the county series maps, which are mapped at uh, 1 to 2,500 or, 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 or close to 25 inches to the mile. Um, there are other maps with, with trees on, uh, the town plans, which are mapped at a larger scale, 1 to 500. Um, and there is a PhD student in Leeds that is working on computer vision on those types of maps. Um, but yes, our code is available. It's available on GitHub um, and via the um, article link that I posted in the chat. Um, but I've, I've also, um, and my colleagues have got a, a bid in at the moment to try and do some work ex expanding on what we've done already. And ultimately the, the, the sort of the seeds of this idea are to create a national historic tree map. So, so really doing this for the entire country. And that's, that's kind of what, what we're working towards very slowly, um, but maybe we'll get there one day. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, Jill, you've got a question which is partly answered. Do you want to put your second part of your question to Hannah? Yeah, it feels a bit silly now because I was thinking about the question and then in the process of my thinking, Debbie was answering it about how easily an individual said, you know, I'm thinking ahead to working with farmers, how easily they could use that, your, your the game on their own land to sort of design mm -hmm. where they might put trees for agroforestry purposes. And um, particularly interesting when that's combined with when Toby's historic data can go into that, how easily they can look at. I mean, how, how easy is it for someone less tech savvy to, to make use of the game and the tool, well, the game? Uh, at the moment, it's not, but it would be relatively trivial for us to be able to put in different, you know, different kind of grids underneath or to find a way where you could upload your own grid or kind of add it in. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's completely feasible. Um, and in terms of kind of inputting the historical data or the kind of existing models, then I'm sure we could find a way to do that. Um, I think I'd maybe defer to Toby here to see how easy it would be <laughs> to add in the historical data, because it would depend if that, if that was existing in that form of that particular location. Toby? Uh, I, I'm not sure myself, I have to say, how easy it would be. We'd have to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ben. OK, great. Um, I think I think that's all the questions um, we have. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to Branching Out team for a really interesting webinar today. Um, I see you've put your email addresses in the chat. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, they can. If they've got further questions, want to follow up on anything, um, we will uh, share the recording um, via the the Treescapes website and the YouTube channel. So that will be available for others to see. So please do feel free to share it. Um, and yes, just thanks. Thanks once again to everybody for your presentations and for coming along and listening.